Welcome to Give Social, a show about helping you improve through inspiration. Each week, we discuss things that make your heart sing through stories, interviews, and debate. Every day, normal people do amazing things in business, charity, or through self-improvement, and we are here to celebrate them. My name's Rob. And I'm Jen. So if you're looking for authentic, down-to-earth, and practical help to build a better life, then we welcome you to the show. And just to make sure you never miss an episode or one of our bonus podcasts that we might throw in from time to time, don't forget to subscribe through your preferred podcast provider. It's easy and more importantly, it's free. Now, let's get on with the show. So today we're talking to Neil Halewood, who by day is an enterprise solutions manager, but who does an enormous amount in his own time for various local charities. He absolutely puts the fun back into fundraising. And so we wanted to bring him to the show to share his story and hopefully leave you with some tips and advice if you want to fundraise for a good cause. Now, we've got to know Neil over the last few years. We spoke to Neil in a previous episode about some of the stuff he's been doing during COVID, which we'll touch upon again, I'm sure in today's show. But first, let's find out a little bit more about the man himself. So Neil, first of all, hello. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Let's start off with you telling us a little bit more about who you are, your day job, um, and a little bit about what life is like for Neil Halewood. Before we do that, it's important that people subscribe. Is this right? <laughs> to give social. We're on, we're, on, we're on YouTube. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Yeah. We're everywhere. Yeah. And you know, we're not trying to yeah. We, we need more. This is really important. <laughs> Neil's, Neil's doing the advertising for us. I like it. I like it. You can play that in future weeks as well. It's fine. <laughs> so so for my job, um, it's really weird because by background, I started off as a, in, in the accounts world um, and I got really bored of the, the month by month numbers, especially when the numbers didn't look very good. Um, so I moved into the IT world 24, 25 years ago for a company called Amec that was based out of Adlington, which was about two miles from my house. Perfect. Now I'm based out of London and I go there two or three times a week. And sometimes I see you on the train. You, you might, we might bump into each other, might we? <laughs> Give each other a wave. And um, so I, I look after, um, Morgan does a, a, a construction infrastructure company. Uh, we build lots of houses just around the corner from here, actually. And we do loads of work. Uh, I look after about 8,000 users every day on commercial, financial, procurement, HR, payroll systems. Oh, how fun. Not really. <laughs> it, it generally is when my phone goes off, someone goes, Neil, it's not working. Um, so, But today we're on holiday, so the phone's off. It's all good today. Excellent. So I've, I've been there for 24 years. Uh, I'm a very believer if, in work, if you don't enjoy doing what you do, do something different. I left yes. my last job because they were moving from Charlie to Blackburn and I thought, I'm not doing that. That's crazy. Yeah. And now I do 40,000 miles a year in the car and spend half the time on the train as well. And I absolutely love it. And there's a real thing, isn't there, Jen, about being, we talked about this last week, getting up to do a job that you absolutely love. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's meaning and purpose behind what you do. And if you, if you either believe in what you do or you're passionate about it, it just makes your day easier, doesn't it, I think. When those problems come up, they're just easy to deal with, aren't they? I can imagine you, Neil, being um, just one massive barrel of laughs at work all day. If, you're on, if, if people are on your right side. I, 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 every bad does. Um, no, generally, I think all, all the team that I work with, from my boss and um, the, the directors to the people who work, who work below me, um, we all enjoy work and we all get stuck in. And generally, all the time, the phone goes off and it's because something isn't working. Um, but even with that, we just get stuck in and we work really hard and we enjoy each other's company. So tell us a little bit about Neil at home. Tell us a bit about your family, where you live, what you enjoy doing in your spare time. So I've been married for uh, 24 years again uh, to Tracy Hellwood, who I met at school at the age of 13. I think I, I found a, a bag one day from school. Um, it went missing. I was a prefect. She was two years below me. And I was a hero at the age of 14, which is incredible, really. Cause I think I'm still a hero now, uh, but she might disagree. <laughs> but then we departed. Uh, we went out a couple of times. And then at 14, I decided that she was just too young for me. So I moved, I moved on to playing um, snooker. And then when I was about 20, we met again and we got married. And we've been married 24 years, which is um, a challenge for her. Fantastic. Inspiration to us all. I think we're, we're reaching 10 years married this year. It's a good test. To know if yeah. you do know the numbers. Yeah. I'm, glad you're like, right. I'm glad you didn't say eight or, like, or it's 12. It's an easy one to remember. Come on. It's all round numbers, Robert. I do remember um, 
your your wedding actually and your wedding your, your best man speech yes <laughs> yes making <laughs> making an appearance yeah. in an episode soon yeah, I'm sure I, I'd expect nothing else <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I'm married with two children now. I've got Lauren, who's 17, presently studying um, to be a surgeon at Runshaw College. So she's doing chemistry. Oh no, I wish I'd not said this one. Chemistry, maths, and something else. She's going to go mad. <laughs> I can't remember what they are. But I've been doing them all weekend. She's, a- she's studying three subjects three to be- and she wants to become a surgeon. Yeah, she does, yeah. There you go. Yeah. I wish I'd said that now. <laughs> got um, you out of trouble there. And then we've also got Matthew, who's uh, 13 in two weeks' time. Uh, Matthew is a special needs child. He goes to uh, Mayfield High School. He is um, one on his own. Yeah. Uh, he has um, significant learning difficulties. 13, he has very little speech. He has no safety around him. In fact, one of the tales is around, I shouldn't say this because this is really bad parenting. <laughs> we came back from um, the woods one night and our daily exercise and we was in the garden and before we knew it, Matthew had just disappeared from the world. We didn't know he'd gone. Right. Um, so I, I'm looking around the garden, shouting Matthew. Normally you can hear his voice. He's always very noisy, not words, but just noise. And he yeah. wasn't there. And I looked around the garden. Lauren went upstairs. We weren't nowhere to be found. Trace went to the front of the house and he was halfway down Carl Right. Literally on his own, wearing this green jacket that we'd just come out. I legged after him. Um, there's cars everywhere thinking, oh my God, this is going to be horrible. As it happened, he just stood still when I shouted some um, pleasant words saying, Matthew, stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and, that's, and this, this must be a challenge for you. I, I imagine incidents like that. It's all day. Yeah. Every day. He, he, I mean, when he, he has a cur, he has three curers, but he's two to one. So whenever he goes out, there's two people with him. Yeah. So it is a challenge, but we don't look at it as a challenge anymore, really. It's just, just the situation you're in. You just deal with it. It's just parenting to Matthew is different to Lauren, but we don't look at it. Other people come in and say, how do you manage? And we don't look at it like that. It's really weird uh, because you just kind of, it's a your day-to-day process. You don't put, four, more, we've got mobile phones on the desk here. That would not happen if Matthew was here because he'd have them and he'd be calling 999 within seconds. It, the cups on things, he just, he has everything. He's into everything. I mean, he's brought three iPads, um, two <laughs> DVD players, a plasma TV. I mean, they've, they've all been broken by Matthew. Yeah. And But we, we don't look at it that way. He's just, it's just the way Matthew is and we deal with it every day and it's just part of life. Fantastic. So I thought that this morning actually when he woke up at one o'clock and didn't like to sleep until quarter to six. <laughs> <laughs> so you would think that with the job that you have working in London, living in the Northwest, dealing with such uh, high demand within the workplace and then going home and having what is, it sounds like an absolutely fantastic supportive family that you have, plus the challenges that come along with Matthew and, and everything that goes along with that, that that would be enough for you. But actually, one of the things we're going to go on to talk about now is all the other things that you manage to squeeze into your day, your week, your month. And that absolutely, I just do not know how you do it all. So let's run through some of these things with you now, Neil. We, we talked about just a couple of things during COVID. So in the last episode, we talked a little bit about Play Your Cards Right. Just tell us a little bit more about what you did with Play Your Cards Right. So play cards right was um it was it was an idea I had I love I love Charlie so I love I love family I love Charlie you'll never move me away and so I do I quite help out at Charlie Football Club supporting the lounge and we've been playing uh, play cards right before the games and sometimes people win after the games as well but I think that was just an excuse for more beer and it was just to try and raise some money so I had an idea when I'm seeing things on Facebook and across the social media about people doing singing and doing magic tricks and things like that I can't sing uh, apart from Sweet Caroline and I can't do any magic so I thought I'd do something a bit different so we went on Facebook Live just to see if we could do play cards right and the idea was everybody got a number who entered I went on the supercomputer which is a mobile phone. It's not really super. Um, <laughs> and it just randomly draw a number. And that person, their name would be given out. They had then 20 seconds to give me a call. Um, and then they'd start off at 10 cards, try and go higher and lower down to one card. And if they won, they won some great prizes. We had um, pizzas being delivered. We had MOTs. We had Gilded Lily provided. Uh, she's, in fact, Margaret was amazing. She gave uh, 35 bouquet flowers every week for 12 weeks and wow. went and, and delivered them wherever they were. Brighton was a step too far. She decided <laughs> to get someone else to do them for her. But people like that, that's why I love the town because people just come together mm. to try and do something to help out. And it was 12, 13 weeks. I had no idea whether it would work. Tracy said I was mental. Lauren said, let's just do it though. Um, <laughs> and Matthew just said, nah. But he says that to everything. <laughs> um, and we, we did it and people made a donation. We didn't want to charge for it. It was just trying to do something that was fun because even though the lockdown is kind of easing a little bit now, there was nothing for anybody to do. 
Mm. It was a Sunday. It was six o'clock. Songs of Prayers have finished. <laughs> what, what, what else do you do? Um, so we went on Facebook Live. Some episodes lasted at half an hour. One went on for about an hour and 10 minutes because people just wouldn't win. And it was just a bit of fun. And the feedback we got from it was really good. But the, the cleaning of the kitchen took two hours before and we had to knock on the other at some point. <laughs> it was deep clean every single Sunday. But that, that's the thing. And that's what we find so interesting about what you've done is you've, you've seen an opportunity. You've seen what's working for people. You've seen what's going on on social social media through all of this time and you've grabbed it and just taken the opportunity you know quick turnaround stuff but it's worked it's been really successful and I think you did pretty well fundraising with that though didn't you in the end I think it was about just short of three thousand pounds but when you're throwing ten pounds and five pounds it all adds up and we we went from the first week I think there was 40 or 50 people played to in the last week there was like over 200 I mean there's 200 people just logged in we had prizes for the kids that they're getting trips Mm -hmm. up Lightning McQueen Mm-hmm. with a careful a, a, a treats and stuff. And it's just it's just good when people come together and sometimes it just needs that one person to trigger it just to like, let's do this. It's a good idea. Let's do it. And people go along with you. And and you're always the person who triggers it, aren't you, Neil? Yeah, apparently so. That's what the <laughs> wife says anyway. But yeah. We do. And we, we see it all the time. I mean, I'm a resident close to where you live in the northwest of England. So whenever there is a charity event for particular charities, there's always one person who's at the front of that. And that's you, isn't it? So what else we had during COVID was live in isolation. Yes. Tell us about live in isolation. Oh, it was such a disappointment. We had such a, we had, we had an amazing event lined up this year. We was going to do Chore Fest and we had some of the best tribute bands across the UK that were going to turn up in at Botany Bear. And we had loads of like the, the local artists as well to give them an opportunity. It was just going to be great. Then along comes the disease yeah. and everything gets put on stop. So it cost us quite a bit of money in fairness. We're not talking about that. Um, <laughs> so, but we decided that only two or three weeks before we thought, right, okay, we've cancelled the event, but let's see what we can do differently. So we contacted some of the local artists and a couple of the tribute bands and they said, yeah, they've been more than up for um, doing something um, live again on Facebook, which seems to be the place to be. And that brings lots of challenges. Yeah. But we did a Friday night um, where we had an 80s singer, the lady was from Newcastle, Karen, she was brilliant. We had a meatloaf tribute on the Friday night. And we were having like three, four, five hundred people all viewing it. Yeah. Which was brilliant. And I wasn't, I had no idea. I'm, I'm in my conservatory that was made up like as a studio. I had no idea whether people would watch it or not. But in fairness, we raised another three thousand pounds. Um, we had, we had some of the local businesses that were throwing in different offers from Frederick's ice cream to the spinners at Carolyn who throw in donations as well. We had a special beer that was being provided for us. Again, I'm very much Charlie and district person. I, I spoke to these people, they all got involved and we just had two really, really good days. Yeah. And it wasn't that we, we made £3,000, we would have made a lot more than that for Darren House and Inspired Youth Zone if it had gone ahead. Yeah. But it couldn't go ahead. So rather than do that, let's not waste opportunity. Let's do something. So the original idea was this event that followed on from something that happened, I think it was over Christmas where you had a a Christmas carol. Oh, that um, was another crazy idea. <laughs> yes. We, we were doing last year's Jingle All The Way. And we'll talk about Jingle All The Way shortly. We will. But So that, that's an annual event that we, we do. But during, during that, we had a conversation about wouldn't it be great if... Because what, what I really liked when I, Lauren was at Holy Cross, they had this um, a Christmas uh, performance where they had singers and they had brass bands. And I really enjoyed it. It, it, it was part of Christmas. And she left. Ooh. So there wasn't that thing to look forward to. And I even tried to get tickets to the Holy Cross one, uh, but they wasn't doing one this year. And my mind goes in strange ways. And I'm thinking, well, let's do it ourselves. And this was like four, four weeks before Christmas. Yeah, we can do this. So I literally spoke to a million choirs to say, do you fancy this? And all going, fully boot, fully boot. And then I made um, a conversation with my old PE teacher, Miss Eccles. And she said she was part of the rock choir for Charlie Lytham and Wigan. And they'd do it. And I thought, this is ace. Um, so I got them. I got a, a lady from uh, Leyland called Jennifer who came along, and then we got a young lad called Ben um, who who did the guitar and stuff. And we just we sold out like 350 tickets at Chow Little Theatre. And I'm thinking this is crazy because at five to seven the doors open at seven o'clock. And I thought we still don't know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was trying to rehearse an intro to it. I'm thinking, oh my god, there's people here. What are we going to do? But again, that night we raised something like 1,700 pounds for charity, and it was literally thrown together. We were still plugging speakers in at five to seven because they'd finished the like two week run of the pantomime the night before and the place when we went in was just, there was stuff everywhere. <laughs> so we're cleaning it all up and just, and everybody that came just had a really good night. And my last line, I remember my last line of the night before we played Old Lang Syne, I got everybody up doing the Old Lang Syne was, whatever happens in 2020, let's make it a good one. <laughs> we're, we're in August and no one can go out. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, if that's my fault, I'm really sorry. But let's put the best of it. So yeah, that was a, it was a good event. And I think everybody enjoyed it. And we'll try and do something again this year. It were loud. So there's other things around Christmas that you've done. So you've mentioned the jingle all the way, which we can talk quickly about. But then there's other things like the Santa Dash as well. So talk us through a little bit about your involvement with, with that. It's it's really stressed. I started this... Um, it's a sad tale, really, because my, my good friends, their son died at 11 with cancer. And that's where the old Derry and Hosting started. You spent a bit of time there. I remember now thinking, I need to do something. I need to, this is always an emotional for us, so bear with me. Um, I, I made a promise that I'd do something every year, just to try and give something back, because my life is quite good. I have a nice life. I have a challenges in life, but actually, we're all healthy. We're all good. So I thought, rather than watching Netflix, um, even though I do like Netflix, Modern Family, if you've not seen it, watch it. It's very good. I thought I could give some time each night in my life just to try and put something back into it. So we started in, we started events back in 2012 with a bike ride where 70 people went to Skipson, my brother's house, and cycled back to Chorley. The year after, we thought, let's do something really stupid and let's walk to Blackpool Tower and back which is 59.7 miles, and let's do it at one take. And we did that in 19 hours and 20 minutes. I have still got blisters, and it's eight years ago. <laughs> the year after, because that was a bit of a challenge, we did the same route, but we did half of it on bikes and half of it walking, which got 100 people involved. I thought, this is really difficult. Let's do something much more easier and get more people involved. And that's where we came up with it. In fact, well, me and Tracy, Matthew and Lauren, was walking up to Rivington. I remember this really clearly. Tracy goes mad when I think about it. And we're walking up on Good Friday, which was the traditional thing to do. And I remember walking thinking, wouldn't this be ours with loads of people dressed as Santa? <laughs> and, and Tracy's going, no, it wouldn't. And Lauren's going, yes, it would, Dad. <laughs> and Matthew's going, nah. <laughs> we spoke about it all the way there and all the way back. And she went, go on then. So we thought rather than do it in December time, which is always dead close to Christmas parties. And, and I, not just like, a, sometimes you go on these sponsor things, they're just like, you do it and then you come back and it's all done. I wanted to make a day of it. So we had a, a good start in the morning. We then went up to Rivington, all dressed as Santa with music, Christmas music playing out, which is really random in November where you've got like, we wish it could be Christmas every day with 600 Santas falling along. It's a great time to kick off Christmas, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, End of November. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I think so. And I love Christmas. I love Charlie and I love Christmas. <laughs> um, but it was just um, a really good spectacle. And then you think the first year we had 147 people that joined. And last year, which was the fourth year, we had just short of 600. And it's just, I mean, we've raised over that period of time up to last year. Um, we've raised just over £100,000. It's fantastic. Which is, it's not bad, is it? It's all it's right. It's absolutely Amazing. fantastic. Tell us a little bit about what it takes to put together a community event like the Santa Dash. Give us, give us the reality check, Neil, of actually how much work goes into organising something like this. Well, last year for the first year, I actually got my little notepad out and I made notes of it, how much time I was spending on it. And the three months prior to it, we spent something like 250 hours out of work time. After that, my boss might listen. Yes. Um, yes, but it was 250 hours just by me on a computer at night. When you're working full time, and I do have a busy job, when I'm, when I'm trying to get favours in from people, they're all at home and don't want me nagging them. So it's generally all on email and text messages. I wasn't speaking to many people through the hire company, through the toilet guy who provided the temporary toilets. It was all via a text message saying, please, pal, I know it's late, but can you say you can do this, this, and this? And... It just, every night was pretty relentless for three months before. But I've never said no to anybody who wants to help. I'm a, I'm a, I won't say I'm a control freak. I like to know what's going on. and Because like, if I'm doing it, I like to do things properly. And I just, I, I have a good support team around me of people who never say, they're, they're really random people because they always say, yes, Neil, okay, then I haven't yet asked them a question. So they've said <laughs> yes before I've said what I want them to do. And we've got a really good support from support drivers to people who sponsor events to throw money at it. I'm asking for money and they don't even know what it's for. And you just go, yeah, pal, whatever you want, I'll just give you and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and you've built up that trust then with people in the community who know that when Neil Hill puts on an event, it's going to be raising money for a good cause and it's going to be great fun. Yeah, I think um, it, it is. When, when you look at the Jingle All The Way now, everybody looks forward to that at Christmas. I mean, I, I emailed Sir Lindsay Hoyle about two weeks before the event last year because he was a bit busy trying to get the, deputy, uh, the Speaker of the House job, uh, which he got. <laughs> And he actually came back from London last year on the Friday night just to be at Jingle All The Way before Fantastic. he went back to London on the, on the Saturday afternoon for the Remembrance Sunday. He had to be at on the Sunday morning in London. So and I, and when you think that, I think, well, I mean, I, I know that's his wife as well, but he really came back just to see me dressed as a Santa. <laughs> <laughs> and so you say that you love charity. We can see that through all these events. You also say that you love Chorley. Now, for those who don't know, Chorley in the northwest of England little Lancashire town. It also has a football club, Chorley Football Club. And over the last year or so, 
you've taken much more an active part in Chorley Football Club as well. From a, I know you've been supporting Chorley for many years, but now somehow, somewhere, you now have much more of an active role with them as well. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I, I want to, I, again, I want to do somebody a favour. I love Chorley Football Club. Sporting them forever. We beat Wolves in the FA Cup 1986. It's getting further and further away, but we did it and it was amazing. But I've always followed Charlie. I've always followed my local team. And then last year I was talking to a couple of the commercial team and the owner and I wanted to just try and help out. So I said, what can I do? And they said, will you host a lounge for all the sponsors? I went, yeah, whatever. And I went to Florida, came back on the date. I landed back about nine o'clock of the morning. They had the first home game in the National League. And I thought, oh no, I've got to be there in two hours. And I literally got off a plane Came home about 11 o'clock, went straight to Charlie Football Club and then I stood there playing play cards right in front of 100 sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody enjoyed the experience. I've got a good relationship with the owners and the manager. I just try and give something back again. The wife's not quite happy about that. She thinks I should just go up five to three to watch the football <laughs> and come back straight as soon as it's finished. But I got her a ticket over the Christmas period and she came in. She had some turkey and she was quite happy. She knew I was working. So this is... This is another example there where there is just another community within your community that you're there fronting up, bringing people together, making sure that actually, you know, let's be honest about this. Chorley Football Club, for those who don't know, the league that they're in. We just is, got relegated. It's a, sh- it's a shame. <laughs> so they've just been relegated from. We, we got relegated from the National League and we're back in the National League North, which is still a very good challenging division. Yeah. And and how many people do they have attending each week, watching, supporting? Well, if, if we got, it's changed in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, we was getting 200. 300 people and and then we've we had a big resurgence we've got three promotions in 10 years and we're no one relegation and we're average crowds about 1100 people yeah which for charlie that's surrounded by preston wigan bolton blackburn united city liverpool you can carry on yeah it's a good it's a good crowd fantastic when we talk about raising your money you tend to as a rule the money tends to go to darien house and to the inspire youth zone yeah. is that right yeah and the inspire youth zone is local is in chorley darien house again another amazing local charity so just tell us a bit more really about your connection to darien house and i think you know it's it's something like 4.8 million a year to run um, and less than 10 percent of that is through statutory funding. So obviously it's really important that people do take the time to fundraise for charities like this. So just tell us a bit more about your connection with so, the so with, House. With, 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 with Inspire, Inspire, when we were kids, there were youth clubs, weren't there? You could go and you could just, a, a safe environment um, where you could go spend the night. Your parents knew where you were um, and, it, and it was good. They seem to have like gone away. So Inspire is somewhere where you can go and you, you're in a safe environment. They have five-a-side football pitches. They have climbing walls. They have pool tables. They have a place where you can go and spend time with friends and new friends. And that's partly funded by the the, the local councils, um, but they've got to make the rest of the money up themselves. But it's just a nice place to go. Whereas Darren House is a place where, it's, it's a shame, and it's hard talking about it, but it's where people go to, they're going to die at some point. And it's, yeah. it is hard to discuss. And so when you think, I think they have to deal with 400 children a, a year that are on their end of life or they're in for respite care. Yeah. Um, and they get, they need 4.8 million every single year to survive and they get 10%. Everything else is through things like charity events. There's a man two weeks ago who walked from um, Westminster Bridge to Darien House, 247 miles, and he walked it wow. and raised £6,000. £6,000 is an incredible amount of money. Yeah. I mean, it's also a very long way to walk. Yes. <laughs> um, but there's, there's things like that happen every single day. So if we, if we can just do something that brings a pound, because yes. one, one pound, this pound or that pound, it goes to an amazing charity and it's helping families enjoy the time they've got left with the, with the children. And also when they, they go for respite, curse, or the, I know how difficult it is when you've got a child that needs 24 seven. So if they can go for one night and just give the parents yeah. uh, one night for a nice meal somewhere. Yeah. I can't tell you how much that means to them parents because it's, it is a challenge. Yeah. And we've all in our lives lost loved ones. And very often through life, you are at some point going to experience a death in the family. Uh, normally, in in a normal circumstance, you would expect that that would be a grandparent, a parent. But that thought of it being your child, yeah, uh, or one of your friend's children, I mean, I, I, that that fills me with, um, you know, can't even start to comprehend yeah. what that must feel like. Um, and and this place, Darien House, it offers it offers that glimmer of hope in an environment where they know that they're being cared for. The parents can, as you say, take a bit of respite as well as the child taking respite. I think um, it, it, Darren House is a, a, an amazing place because you can go. And 
I've always felt uncomfortable going beyond the front door because it, I do get emotional and it just me, I'm a big softer, big lad, but I'm a big softer. They do amazing work. It's the happiest place in the world. Do you mean mm-hmm. the children are not, they're not sad. They're very, they're in a happy environment. They have swim pools there. They've got a brand new movie center there. It's just an amazing place. You don't see people walking around all miserable and negative. It's a positive vibe. Yeah. The second you walk in the place from the staff to the children, it, it really is amazing. I mean, the, the, it was 1991, um, there was a, the Haydock family created and they had um, two kids, Derek and Ian, and they combined them two names to get the word Darian, which right. is where it came from. Um, and the, they had to raise £25,000 to put a fork in the floor to start the build. Um, and then they've handed it over to a lady who, who took it to another level. But they're celebrating the 30th anniversary next year, so they've got to do something special. Yeah. Because it's a lot of money they need to raise. You can't underestimate it. How much money that is. It's a lot of charity walking. It's a lot of charity events. Um, but they also do things. Um, they'll send families to Ribby Hall Village where they can spend two or three days there with a the family in an environment that's not in your own home. So they might not be able to go into Derry for the respite, but they're going to they have a nice area to go to of Ribby Hall. And they, yeah. have, they have two apartments there. And the families go, they take some time away from life. And it's just a really... I can't tell you how positive a place Darien is. It's a sad place to go, mm. but when you're there, it's amazing. The, the yeah. positivity around it is incredible. Yeah. What we'll do is we support all of that and these these charities mean a lot to us. And it's part of the reason why we're doing this podcast in the first place is to bring all of this conversation to the fore and all of that inspiration that people need just to understand how important it is that there are organisations that need, you know, that need that support. So we're going to put a link in to donate into the website so that people can get straight through if they if they feel like they something something they want to support. So just going back, obviously we've talked about how you balance it all with your, your busy day job and a busy home life. And you've mentioned Tracy um, and, and your children. So is the whole family involved in supporting you in this? Is it something that you just drag them into or is it something uh, they I, proactively I, help with? I, I, I'd like to say that they uh, proactively get involved with, apparently like a train, I just run straight over them. And before they've got a choice to do anything, they're, they're involved and they have no going back. As, Lauren, as the older Lauren's got, she's, she's very, similar to her dad um, and she just comes along on the journey with me and she loves it so we, bu- we bully Tracy and she just comes along <laughs> but everything we do is is complete as a family my number one thing in life is, is the family I'll go to work so we can have a nice life that's why we do a lot of these things at night I mean we spend our lives at Blackpool just taking Matthew on the beach he loves it on the beach flying his kite and though he lets it go when it's really windy and wipes about 20 people out along the journey <laughs> <laughs> so we do everything as a family and that includes the charity work so I'm just I'm just here for the looks and the personality and we um, we talk about this quite a bit um, in our other episodes and Jenna touched upon it before around this purpose and passion stuff. And, and it's so much easier, isn't it, Neil? I, I, when you've got a family around you who are also involved with that, and this is something that we, we really strongly believe in as a couple, we, what we do outside of work, we want to be able to do that together. And although some people will look and say, well, you're just doing more work. You, you're finishing work and then you're getting home and you're turning your laptop on and you're making phone calls and you're organizing events and you're doing event planning and you're doing fundraising. When, when do you get time to switch off? And some people would genuinely be concerned about your own well-being and your welfare. And, and I get this quite a lot with Jenna and when, with the stuff that we do. And people say, you know, how do you switch off? But I find that strength in family unit, that collective passion that you all hold for something really does help. Do you find that as well? I, I think um, there's a big thing about men- mental awareness at the moment and I absolutely 100% get it and the, I'm, I'm the first person who sends a text or picks a phone to, to, to people I try and find time for all the people that I know are on their own some of my work, team I work with I know they're, they're on their own the, the, the young people growing up and I've met times at the weekends to speak to these um, and in fairness one, one bloke rang me up uh, who you know and he, he phoned me up and said Neil I've seen play your cards right it's brilliant I've seen this it's brilliant I'm just phone up I'm just making sure you're okay because you've asked about everybody else but are you okay? I know who that was because that same person rang me as well. Did I? <laughs> and we had the same conversation. Um, so, and, and that was nice, but me and Trace have a very, very, very strong relationship in everything we do. And our family is the number one thing and we talk every day. In fact, we've, we've had one cross word in 25 years and that was in Ibiza. Another story. <laughs> <laughs> it has something to do with Sweet Caroline and a lot of vodka. <laughs> um, um, but we, we ju- we're just a strong family. Um, we talk about everything. We have no secrets. And I think that, does help a lot. And we, we both work very hard. Tracy worked for uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland for 28 years. She was a senior person there. Uh, that finished a couple of years ago. She now works in the leadership role in the, in the police, if I'm allowed to say that. 
Um, I don't know. Sorry, Tress. But we, 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 we talk about everything. We work hard, we play hard, but our family's the number one and everything we do for charities, it's there. It's always there, but you do it like at, at night time when kids, I'm going to say kids are asleep when they're getting older now. And so I think th- there's so many people out there who will be inspired by what you've done, uh, who will be inspired by all the money that you've been able to raise, who will be sat scratching their heads thinking, how does he do it? And I, I'm just interested because it doesn't always all go to plan, does it? So tell me something about maybe what's the worst thing that's happened in planning or running one of these events. Give us a story. It can be funny. It can be sad. It can be absolutely disastrous. But let's put a bit of reality around how difficult organizing things like this are and what can happen. We, we haven't had, we haven't had. The, the amount of time I put in, I try and avoid any disaster. I spend a lot of time thinking, what if, what if, what if. And we had lots of events in August. Sun should be shining, you're in blue skies, you're walking to Blackpool, you're walking back or you're cycling somewhere. And, you're, and the, the biggest disaster we had was probably it never stopped raining. <laughs> and I, I made the decision that one of the things we would do, um, two buckets of water, we'd carry these two buckets of water up Rivington and back and it never stopped raining. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the blog, I remember him now, he's a rugby player, Andy Rydalsh, and he just he said, just pass me an eel, I've got this. <laughs> and he carried literally all the way to Rivington and back. We, we haven't, the, the biggest disaster we've had is, is, the, the COVID, just because the amount, the amount of time I put into Chorefest was much more than we put into any of the other charity events, arranging um, all the different licenses because it was going to be a, a decent event with three, 4,000 people there. You, fill, you spend relentlessly filling forms in, which is absolutely the right thing to do because all the council, all the police, all the emergency services need to be happy with everything you're doing, and they were. Um, but to get to that position, paying for all the different licenses that you need to go out, and then all the people are selling the tickets and, you, and then I think, are people going to come? Are people going to buy these tickets? And then they do when you're thinking, right, now I've got 2,000 tickets, got sold. <laughs> and then you start hearing this thing in China that's going on in the background in about November, December time. You're thinking, ah, that'll go away. That won't come here. Mm. And then it comes to you in January, February, you're thinking, oh my God, we've spent like two grand on this. And then in March thinking, this isn't going to happen. And then you go on lockdown. And that was, it was a emotional time to close it, to say, we, we can't do this. Yeah. But it was the right thing to do. Yeah. And then you press the button saying refund tickets. You're thinking, oh my God, <laughs> this has just cost me two grand yeah. and we're not going to get it back. Yeah. But yeah. again, you, you take the risk with that. Everything we've ever done, we've tried to, we spend so much time trying to work out what if, what if, what if. Mm-hmm. Um, and we always go overboard with things rather than doing it. I try and do things properly. I said that before. I try and do things properly mm-hmm. like it's a proper, a proper job, <laughs> uh, even though it's not paid. And it, it just, we, we, the only disaster we've had was, was it's not a disaster. It was the COVID that, that was, that was hard to take. Mm-hmm. But at the time, one of the bands said, why are you cancelling so early? I'm going, because it, this isn't going away. It's, it's here and it's here for a while. And he, he, he won't give me my 400 quid back. <laughs> <laughs> After this, well, so he, 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 he's not booked next year. He's cancelled. Um, <laughs> We, we haven't had any disasters. And the disasters, it sounds daft. We do it with a smile. So mm. It rained and rained and rained and rained and never stopped raining for 12 hours. It just didn't stop raining. But we were all smiling in the pub at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so, but it is, it is, a, I can't, it is hard work. I mean, we're, we're presently in the process of arranging this year's jingle all the way. And now we're doing it as if it's going ahead. Mm-hmm. But we know where we are today yeah. and whether it can go ahead. But we're planning that it's going to happen. But to get six, seven hundred Santas in one place at one time, walking 15, 16 miles together in different stops and everything. Yeah. It's going to be a challenge to do yeah. and we, we don't know if it's going to happen or not, but we're pl- presently planning today like it's going to happen on the yeah. 14th of November. So what three pieces of advice for anyone looking to run an event in their community or do some fundraising have you got for people who might just be either starting out or if they've done things previously but want to try something different? Have you got... Any advice at all that you would? I, I would say the biggest, I, I, I was not a charitable person before I started these events. I didn't really do charity events. I didn't have time to do charity events. My mind arranged them. And then something struck me with a little lad dying and I thought, I need to do something. Do something that you're passionate about with a reason why you're passionate. Because it, it, mean, it means it makes the difference. If you just do something because it's the trendy thing to do, it takes too much time. You've got to be passionate about what you're doing. Darren House is very, very passionate for me. So we'll do everything we possibly can to raise money for them. And if you don't have that, if you don't care about it, you won't do a proper job with it. And I absolutely put everything into it. Never say no to anybody. If someone, <laughs> say, if someone says, can I help you? You say yes. Yeah. You, don't, you might not know what it's going to be and you will get, if, you, if, you, if you're passionate about it, 
you will get lots of people that say, I will help you. Never say no. Even if you don't know what they're going to do at that time, never say no. If it's taking photographs, if it's pouring cups of tea, if it's driving a van for 19 hours and 20 minutes while you walk to Blackpool and back, <laughs> you've got to say yes to every bit of help you can get. You've got, you've got to care about what you're doing. If, if, if it's not there, it just won't work. You've got to, I, I exaggerate the point, but Darren House means the world to me. Yeah. And I've only ever been there to, to give the certificates. I struggled to go into the place, I said before. But I care so much about it. And that, that every, you, you can see that what it means to me. Yes. And other people do as well. And they all think I'm crackers, but it just means the world. And if you do that, you show that passion, they will go with it. If you say yes to everybody, they will come and support you. Make sure your family's with you. Because if you're on your own, you're, str- you're going to struggle. I do push on on finances, trying to get money, but Darren House appreciate the, um, the awareness they get as well. It's yeah. not. It's not all about the money. So many people in Charlotte who've done these events. I didn't even know Darren House existed. I didn't know what it was. I've kind of heard it somewhere mentioned. But yeah. and the awareness that Darren House have got out of these events is incredible. So do something you're passionate about. Yeah, and and, and people will come with you. And that's and that's one of the things that we hopefully will be doing through this show to support charities like Darren House and to support people like yourselves as well. Is is that awareness because. We talked about this in our very first episode about what does it mean to give? And people automatically think that give means giving, you know, whatever money you've got left to throw in a bucket or to um, donate online. And sometimes it's about giving anything that you have, either physically or within your capability, that can help somebody else who really needs it. Your, I imagine your job crosses over so much in terms of the skills that you have that you can apply to raising money and organizing yeah. these events. Yeah, I think it does. I think I, I don't come across as organized, but I'm quite an organized person at work. People turn up to charity events and they just think, that went really, really well. I really, really enjoyed today. They won't think Neil spent 250 hours putting this together to make yes. sure you have a really good day. Yeah. Um, and that's what people don't, and, and people do, they pay the 15, 20 quid to join and they rock up, they get the sand trophy, they get a medal and they walk 15 miles, they've got a couple of blisters and think that was really, really good. Mm. They won't think Neil spent three and a half months arranging toilets, arranging first aid, arranging. Yes. There's one lad who comes over here, my brother's brother-in-law comes up, he's, um, he works on Snowden, so he comes up and does the walk with us with his rucksack on, he's ready to pounce if anybody goes over at any time. Yeah. But he lives in Snowden, he travels up like three o'clock in the morning of the events. Yeah. And he gets home about midnight because he's there supporting it because he can see. And I, I ask him to do it. Yeah. And he goes, yes. He doesn't yeah. know the dates. He doesn't know any other details. He just goes, yes. And I have so many people that do that and support that. It's just, it's good really. I mean, when you, when, when you set up on a journey like this, you're thinking, I think the first thing I actually did was I, I ran a 6K in Ashley Park for sports relief. Um, yeah. probably 2011, 2012. Now I've not run six miles for a long time and probably wouldn't <laughs> do it today. Um, but it raised 200 quid and that was, a, so you think 200 pound to 104,520 quid, which is what it is. Not that I count every single day. <laughs> um, it, it is a lot of money. And when you think how much they need, it's just a drop in the ocean to yeah. what they actually need. But we try and do a bit. Brilliant. And this is your opportunity now to tell us what's Neil's plans coming next. You know, what have you got coming up? What, what are your plans for the future? It can be, something you've already got in the pipeline or tell us about some of the crazy ideas that you, the things that you would love to do in the future. And we'll see if in some way we can try and help do that as well. I think we've got to try and keep doing the jingle all the way. Cause I think now it's a bit of a spectacle for Charlie. I think people enjoy it. Um, they see it's part of the, the Christmas lead up, like we said before. So I think that would be good if we can, can, can keep going with that. There's a question about this year because of the worldwide pandemic that's knocking around, but we'll still have a go at doing something. Chore fest, hopefully next year, chore fest will come off. Uh, we're certainly going to have another go. Again, we don't know what's happening in the world, mm-hmm. but we've already started plans. We're working with the council and getting the right dates because we don't want them to do something on the same time we do something. So our plans have started there. I can't tell you how much fun last year's single singer song for Christmas was. It was a really <laughs> good atmosphere where everybody's joined in with a rock choir. They were brilliant. We're going to have another go at that. One of the people I work with, Paul Kerr, on these things, he want, he's very passionate about doing um, uh, sportsman's dinners and, and, and things like that. So we want to do something. It's anything really that, trying to be a bit different. We have a driving move that we tried to pull off. Unfortunately, due to lots of different reasons, we've, we had to pull that, um, which was a shame. But I think the timing of it was all a bit rushed to try and get it in place. So we had to pull that. But I think that will be something fun for the future we could try. I'm all over doing it, trying to do something a little bit different. When you think you're walking up Rivington thinking, let's get 600 people dressed as Santa, that was just an idea that came into our head and we made it happen. And things like that spark in my mind. I wake up at three o'clock in the morning with a little pad outside of my bed and I write it down. 
And then in the morning, I think I can't even read my own writing. Um, <laughs> but there's always something that you can do. And I like to do something a bit differently, like to do it properly. I like the fun element of everything we do. Mm -hmm. I know it's a serious cause we raise money for, but if you can put the fun into it, if you put the fun into it, people will put more money into it. Yeah. I mean, there was one lad when we did the jingle all the way last year. He, he walked from Chorley to just gone through Adlington and he saw a bus. He jumped on the bus. He got everyone's money on the bus. The bus was going back to Chorley and he had to walk all the way back again to catch us all up. <laughs> but on that bus, he got like 150 quid. He just yeah. went through everybody's pockets and said, come on, <laughs> give me your money. But then he thought, oh no, I've just gone back two miles. <laughs> so he had to come all the way back again. There was one where we were walking in the middle of the road, which is completely wrong and you shouldn't do this address to Santa. But there's two police cars. I think, oh no, <laughs> this is not good. We're going to get showed to that now. And the guy in the Santa outfit would not let the two police cars go past until they'd been through both the officers' money. <laughs> they took all the money out of the vaults, everything. I think we got 200 quid from them. I think that went all right. <laughs> but there's just the little things that like you remember that, that are good. Um, and it's just... They're just good fun days, aren't? and that's what your office would have been if it, that come off as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Neil. We really, really appreciate uh, you spending time with us this morning, sharing a little bit more about you and everything that you have done. Uh, I think on behalf of both uh, me and Jen, we just want to say well done. Cheers. Uh, keep it going. Uh, if there's anything that we can do to support you, please do let us know. Please come back to us in terms of promoting anything that you're doing. We will make sure that on the link to this podcast, on the link in the website, um, on Facebook, we'll put links out to Derry and House. If, if you've got any particular links you want people to follow, we'll make sure they're on there as well. And we'll make sure that people in Lancashire know everything about the events that you've got coming up in the future. So thank you very much, Neil. Perfect. Okay. And don't forget to subscribe. <laughs> this is it. Give social. Get, well, search for it. You'll find it. Subscribe. <laughs> press the red button. It'll go ping. Put the bell. And if you press the bell, you won't miss any notifications. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Well. <laughs> and so it's time for us to finish for today. But we will be back next week with another episode. And we can't wait for you to join us. So before then, why not join our Facebook group, Give Social, or head on over to our website, givesocial.co.uk. We've got some special things lined up for subscribers as well and Facebook followers. We've got giveaways, guides and free tips, so don't miss out. See you all next week for more Give Social. Bye-bye.